Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Inference where we talk about programming languages and other fun stuff. Today I'm really happy to have with us a software architect, an, an expert in functional programming, a book author, Alexander Granin. Welcome Alexander, how are you? How? Hi Michael, thank you for asking me to join to this podcast, it's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Um, I would like to start by asking you uh, who you are, what you are doing, and how you got there, meaning how you started writing functional code. Yeah, as you said, uh, I am a very big fan of functional programming, and it all started maybe 10 years ago. And actually, I was uh, a mainstream developer at that time, like a C++ developer later on uh, C-sharp developer and a little bit of Python because, you know, in production you have to deal with different languages and that's what we actually um, had in our code bases. Um, Haskell was my hobby and functional programming was my hobby uh, maybe for seven years or, or so and I did a lot of interesting things in this area uh, for myself and for the community. Uh, for example, I've been leading some uh, meetup here in, in Siberia about functional programming and I, I was giving talks and I still do, I'm still doing that. Uh, yeah, and uh, it it's actually started all uh, very simply. I, I read some article about Haskell, didn't understand it, and uh, it <laughs> was like a challenge to, to try to understand what's happening there in the functional programming world. And I started uh, learning Haskell. It, it was uh, one week of a real pleasure to, to, to learn Haskell because everything was so... Uh, so right uh, from the start, so uh, con concise, so conscious, and I, I, lo I loved uh, Haskell from the first okay. side. Yeah. Okay, so you're now writing Haskell code for for a living. I mean, is that your first, uh, your main uh, stack during your current job? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a software consultant. I, I believe it's uh, not a, a really a rare case in the Haskell community because we mostly have uh, several big cons consultancies and I write for different companies. Uh, currently it's uh, an Indian company, financial company, and actually I'm not just a Haskell developer, right? As you mentioned it, I wrote a book about functional design and architecture in which I, I'm providing uh, new ideas of software engineering in Haskell and in functional programming in general. Uh, some methodology based on free monads and uh, a lot of stuff. I, I believe this stuff was like ignored in the Haskell community and there oh, was okay. a big gap. Okay, thank you. Why do you think that that topic was ignored by the Haskell community? Uh, well, from my experience, uh, uh, when I was um, interacting with the community like five years ago or maybe even seven years ago, uh, I've noticed that um, the community is very uh, focused on some cool things like uh, category theory, like mathematics related to, uh, to, to functional programming, lambda calculus, other calculi, and um, type theories. It was really, really um, interested in, in learning the, the surface of scientific functional programming and okay. very encouraged to, to do so. But the things I am talking about in my book are, are all about practice, about industry usage of functional programming, and this kind of uh, knowledge uh, which wasn't in in the uh, focus of of the community because it it sounds so mainstreamly, so um, I would say. Uh, 
maybe even dirty if we take it into quotes okay. because you you have to solve real problems you 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 don't uh, need to to think about too much math you don't need to challenge your your mind with with difficult but interesting things you just need to solve problems in, in the business world so yeah. uh, i guess uh, yeah this i uh, the majority of community just wasn't interested in in this topic and therefore it had such a big gap there okay okay got it uh we will be back on the community uh, later on during the episode uh for now i would like to ask you uh given that you're also a mainstream programming language uh, uh let's say developer given that you wrote uh, c plus and c sharp and a bit of python code what did you find in functional programming that you couldn't find in other, uh, you know, paradigms or even languages? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, actually. And well, in in reality, uh, when I was a C++ developer, when I was learning C++, I realized that many techniques I use for my day-to-day -day life um, have something in common with functional programming. Uh, even before it was, it, it became mainstream. For example, uh, I was trying to avoid mutable state because it makes my program a, a little bit cleaner. Even in C++, it makes sense in, in sometimes. Yeah, mostly you want to mutate things in place because it, it's much more um, beneficial by performance, but sometimes you you can go more immutable for example in in the concurrent environment and it will be much okay. much simpler yeah i also uh, loved the idea of the main specific languages and started um, doing uh, creating many dsls for for my work because uh, we had uh, some rules and we needed to uh, write a lot of xml for these rules and uh, it all can be turned into a short DSLs uh, without writing all those XML trees, big trees. It it will be more simple and we did that. And uh, I realized that many techniques as purity in, in this, for example, um, were very close to what functional programming does, right? Uh, and when I started learning Haskell, uh, it wasn't a big problem for me because I, I was quite prepared to, to these new notions, to this new philosophy. Uh, yeah, in general, I, I believe, I strongly believe that uh, having several concepts from functional programming in your code makes your code better. Yeah. Okay, it, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. 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 And okay, uh, what was the hardest part of learning Haskell uh, coming from mm -hmm. C++, C Sharp and other languages? Yeah, uh, it was C++ at that time. And okay. uh, when I uh, tried to switch to Haskell, uh, it was a big problem. Well, yeah, there was certainly a problem to learn monads. Uh, I... Uh, it it took like six months to to grasp the general idea, but before that I was uh, capable to to at least use some of the monads like IO monad. Uh, I okay. didn't understand what it does, and uh, I could not explain uh, how to write your own monads. Uh, to be honest, I can't explain how to write your brand new mon monads today because it's a very scientific question uh, but monads were a, a, a little bit a challenge and I guess another big challenge was uh, the lack of resources on how to solve day-to-day -day tasks with Haskell because everything was so um, dis um, distinct so uh, separated from each other uh, okay separate pieces about some interesting cool math stuff but nothing you could 
take as a methodology nothing you could take and write your own software for something for example for command line application you, you need you you need to invent uh, the structure okay. of your application the the tools to hide complexity the tools to um, do interfaces and implementation separation and etc it it was a problem yeah okay so uh you mentioned the lack of uh, resources for learning Haskell uh, so have you ever had a chance to ask for a community support for learning Haskell and did you find any problem in the community at this step of your you know career path I, I probably not that very typical person uh, and I'm not asking people to help that much because uh, yeah I know how valuable it is but I uh, yeah, the community was not very pleasant pleasant that time because uh, they were talking about so high level and so much stuff uh, mostly and I I didn't understand it and I don't understand it yet and okay. I just was afraid to ask something it looks like mm, you want to uh, to have interfaces in in your functional programming code in your Haskell code for example but you will immediately get an answer go to java interfaces are in java and haskell world doesn't need interfaces but is, this means that people don't uh, uh, they then confuse interfaces as op interfaces as a keyword right and interfaces okay. as a, an idea and this was the problem uh, with the community and i just was afraid to to ask something there were some uh, topics I could ask questions, for example, how to, uh, what I can use for uh, for JSON parsing, for example. That's uh, local questions, not about general questions. And when I asked uh, general questions, how to structure your application, how to do database stuff, how to integrate it into your program, how to design your program, uh, Mm, that was mm, why do you need that? We we are in Haskell. That's uh, mainstream uh, nonsense, and we don't need it here. Just use category theory. It's it's all okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, I got the same experience in the past, and for what I see, it seems like that the Haskell community, in particular, it's full of people with a high knowledge of the topic. And many people so always think that you should already be at that level of knowledge in order to assess Haskell. And I see that as a problem because it keeps the community smaller. So uh, why do you think that that is my personal opinion, of course, but why do you think that there is such a problem in the community? Mm -hmm. Well, the first of all, uh, the times are changing, I believe. And we probably see a big shift from this uh, isolated uh, reasoning of the Haskell community to more open reasoning, to more open mind, um, to 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 even the the ideas we have in in dirty mind stream. Uh, and the the reasons why it was so, yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, um, I I, build, I I I know I will get some negative uh, um, uh, reviews on my uh, opinions, but still it, it, I believe it holds. Uh, people in the Haskell community, majority of people in the Haskell community, uh, were like uh, hobbyists, enthusiasts, and they weren't be, uh, production developers. Uh, okay. And a big majority of the community was. Uh, scientific people, right? And they have uh, a separate uh, idea on how to um, how to interpret uh, the the work developers do, and they have own idea what developers should do. They uh, they think that uh, we need to improve our world, but that's okay. a, a ideal uh, uh, proposition, right? A idealistic or how to say 
uh, a proposition of uh, delivering to a better world. Still, we, we need to deal with our not well-organized and sometimes uh, painful world. And we need to solve business problems. And that's, that's quite a diff different uh, value system from what the community was exposing that time. Okay. And that was the, the, the main reason, I, I guess. Okay, great. Um, do you think that we can encounter the same problems in other programming languages communities, uh, let's say Scala developers community, or, you know, uh, OCaml community? Uh, do you think mm -hmm. that this is something really related to Haskell or, you know, in functional programming in general? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's uh, also a good question. And actually, mm, Haskell uh, is like a pure functional programming, like right? It's a language yeah. which um, it, um, shows how pro functional programming can what what it can be, right? Uh, in its essence. But I guess uh, the same problems can be applied and uh, can be found in in other communities. Maybe in Has in Scala, it's not that sh sharp. Uh, the problem is not that sharp because uh, Scala initially, from from the start, was positioned as a language to to combine OOP and FP. And uh, Martin Adersky um, uh, works hard to join the two worlds. And the the very idea of having FP and uh, a mainstream practices uh, right from the start. Um, formed uh, a community which is okay to to the ideas of of this uh, solving problems instead of uh, doing the world better. Uh, I okay. I guess uh, we can find a lot of different uh, sub communities in, in the Scala world. Um, there are scientific people there. There are business people, and uh, actually, people can write in Haskell in Scala. Three ways. Scala as a better Java, like just another syntax with pattern matching, with better um, types, algebraic data types. Uh, Scala as Scala with own ideas, like implicits, maybe uh, for comprehension and something around that. And Scala as Haskell, which is more functional and tries to borrow ideas from Haskell. So, um, the, the Skull community is really big. It's okay. times bigger than Haskell community. Maybe two times big, uh, bigger, or maybe ten times. I guess it's ten times bigger, something like that. Uh, and you can meet any opinion there. And fortunately, fortunately they, they managed to live together without uh, exposing this, oh, you are doing something... Mm, something not uh, uh, something mainstreamly something dirty we we want to talk about that in in our community it's not our interest the, the you you probably can't won't find this attitude in the skull community that much maybe there is one something but not that much as in haskell um what about uh, other languages uh, c++ has a real story of functional programming integrating in, in, into it because uh, there are features which came with new standards you know, for example lambdas came with c++ 11 and it was like well game changing experience i guess because you, you could uh, define your uh, processing collections with lambdas is much simpler than with loops sometimes and that okay. was just you know, the start in in the in 2011 uh, but later on in C++ 20 they implemented uh, ranges which is uh, massively a massively functional uh, library for fun composing functions to process uh, data structures and uh, containers uh, and what you did by loops and by um, iterating over 
containers you can now do as people do in, in C sharp with link. So functional programming comes to, to mainstream languages in, in different forms. And I, I actually like to watch this process because it shows how uh, mindset of people is changing with time. And uh, sometimes it's changing to uh, to the point when people start writing in in a really different manner than they uh, used to do before that. For example, in C sharp, uh, link changed the way how we process collections, and <clears throat> it's much more convenient. And I, yeah, I I don't see that there there is a person who doesn't like that. Absolutely. However, you can probably see in such a thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, talking again about not not about the community, but the popularity of languages. Uh, yeah, the reason why Scala it Scala community is times bigger than the Haskell one. It's clear. It it is a JVM language, so uh, yeah, it's more popular by default, <laughs> I would say. But why do you think that? Uh, functional programming took much longer to become such popular. So what happened during the last years that made uh, functional programming fun and, you know, attracting again? Uh, yeah, that's uh, in, an interesting story of how our software development industry um, ev evolved with time, right? And actually, functional programming was born like much before OOP, right? Because yeah, there was absolutely. Lisp and yeah, in 60s, 90s, 60s, and it started being functional after several years. And OOP was born like in 80s, uh, 10 years later. But OOP managed to become a dominant paradigm in, in 90s. And I believe there was a reason, and the reason was uh, OOP uh, defined how to solve business problems. And uh, companies um, realized that there is a way to make a development cheaper and more um, convenient with OOP. Uh, whereas FP was uh, flying in, in the skies about... Uh, abstract things about math, about uh, making uh, computer science more um, complete and more rich without touching the needs of business. And this is why it could not grow like crazy. And finally, OOP started solving a lot of problems of business like how you can separate things in your application to to make it more long living and easily changeable. It's always a, a question of design, of course. OP doesn't have a magic um, um, way which does your program good automatically, and FP uh, neither has this property as well. Uh, but there were methodologies people uh, managed to elaborate to show that there is a path you can follow and get something working and this will uh, allow you to um, get money quicker to produce a product quicker to to have it with in in line with your requirements and more or less good quality <clears throat> and this is why it became popular uh, because the industry world uh, w was growing like crazy in in 90s. Uh, it was a new uh, field of economy, economics, right? And uh, the potential of IT sector was really big, uh, whereas the scientific part of our um, activity, like functional programming in, in particular, stayed on the same uh, level of uh, there were just the same amount of people I, I guess okay. more or less in that field and it cannot grow that much 
So uh, OOP won that battle. And what happened next is that people realized uh, the computers uh, become more um, performant and they got more cores and they um, and people need to solve uh, even more bigger problems like big data analysis and tons of uh, uh, clients to support. You can certainly do this with OOP, but um, some uh, people found ways to do it better with functional programming because, for example, uh, there is a um, technology from Google MapReduce, which is in the core of their search engine. And the, the very name of this technology points to the functional programming essence. Uh, Map is uh, getting a collection and uh, iterating over it in a functional way uh, to, to transform it into another collection and reduce is to um, to reduce this collection uh, into a single value maybe uh, according to some rule or function so you you tra transform your collection to a single uh, value to a single statistics uh, to single characteristics you need right now and this is a very functional procedure so uh, this was like one of the main, main uh, application points for functional programming and it started to be more popular and uh, most of the libraries and fi features which came to the languages are about data processing and some of them also about uh, concurrency and parallel processing of data. Um, functional programming makes concurrency much much easier. This is um, my experience from C++ and from Haskell and uh, yeah, and from C Sharp. Uh, it, it's not a very spread knowledge because um, I guess most people just don't do multi-threading programming uh, at all in their life. Uh, but sometimes you, you want to utilize your computer uh, very, very intensively and this all starts playing its own role. Okay. Okay, I got it. So uh, you've identified two uh, different reasons why uh, functional programming wasn't so popular back, let's say, in the 90s, on the 80s. But today uh, we can solve real world problems with functional programming. And also we have access to more computing power, meaning that we can easily parallelize our code, uh, running multi-thread programs, or even distributed software. And functional programming can make this even easier, let's say, uh, thanks to the, the paradigm and the way we write programs. So that makes sense. And so do you think that's one of the reasons why many languages such as, uh, yeah, C++, PHP, Python, and even Java are now implementing uh, uh, functional features such as, you know, uh, generic types or uh, Lambda functions or uh, uh, functional interface for Java with, uh, you know, map reduced streams and stuff like that. So do you think that now it's time to, uh, to move to a new paradigm for solving industry problems? Yeah, thank you for this question. And well, uh, first of all, uh, there is a person who believes that Mm, the notion of, of paradigm is obsolete. Uh, it's Vitaly Bregelievsky. He says mm, paradigms were uh, a thing uh, in the 90s and zeros, but today languages uh, get becoming uh, multi-paradigm, and so it doesn't make sense to t tell about, uh, to speak about paradigms in separate. It's mostly like a mix of those paradigms in real life. So uh, we can talk about uh, different styles of programming, right? A functional style, declarative style, imperative, OOP style, uh, to do things, a logical style, but paradigms mostly uh, get obsolete. Um, this is a very interesting point of view, and I believe uh, it's true to the to the uh, sense that um, even in C++ we see how 
uh, different uh, paradigms reflect each other. For example, uh, it it was realized that um, templates for generic programming in C++ uh, is not just a metaprogramming paradigm there. It's a paradigm which is really related to what we do in Haskell. And these interconnections uh, were one of the interesting findings that of those times. And why languages uh, derive these new features? Well, yes, because um, the world becomes multi-paradigm and because I believe OLP is stuck in its development uh, you know, 10, maybe 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And languages uh, want to, to evolve and they want to make the life of developers easier. So, several uh, features from FP uh, are very uh, good, like algebraic data types. And you know, uh, even uh, C Sharp, uh, implemented records recently. Uh, it's immutable uh, structures for um, keeping data. There were um, structures, there were classes, but now it's also records, a part of algebraic data types and pattern matching, of course. Uh, so uh, the developers of languages, like creators of languages, they they see all these uh, trends in in the functional world. And they uh, they feel how the community demands for these features. Um, no, yeah, not the whole community, of course. There are always uh, a division into uh, early adopters and uh, laggers, so-called, because there is a diagram of uh, adoption cycle. But okay. uh, yeah, the the more people started wanting these features, the 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 less chances to avoid it uh, the creators of uh, languages had. So it's now like a demand from, from the development world. You, you cannot avoid it. And to be said, uh, Scala and JavaScript, uh, in my opinion, uh, are the two languages which um, br brought functional programming into mainstream, not, not yeah, Haskell. Absolutely. Yeah, not not uh, closure, not Erlang, and JavaScript and Scala. Yeah, I, I have to confirm that because when I started to look into Haskell and Erlang mainly, that was because I was writing uh, JavaScript code with React, and yeah, Facebook said, okay, you have to write functional code in JavaScript for writing proper React uh, interfaces, and I was like, okay, what? What does functional programming means? And then went through, you know, Haskell, OCaml, and Erlang for uh, learning more about functional programming. So that's absolutely true. And one last question before going into the conclusion for this episode. Uh, do you think that, uh, you know, having multi-paradigm languages or languages becoming multi-paradigm uh, can make life harder to new developers or even people who has on, only worked with, uh, let's say, object-oriented C Sharp, uh, do you think that it can be harder for them uh, to get started with uh, multi-paradigm languages or getting started with uh, you know, a hybrid between functional and object-oriented paradigm in, a, let's say, C Sharp, which is a great example, but it can be Python or C++, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, uh, bring, bringing more features into a language, into a particular language, doesn't make it easier to learn. It makes it harder to learn. Uh, and, well, we can uh, watch the, the story of C++, which is the most difficult language, uh, industrial language out there, in my opinion. And when you start learning C++, even C++ of of the mm, 90s, you can easily uh, draw in, in the number of features there. You can easily um, get lost uh, in how to do things and how to solve problems, either with metaprogramming uh, or with templates or with uh, uh, bare functions in um, classes and, and etc. A lot of features 
and it makes um, learning path really difficult and uh, more features are coming more learning paths could be possible uh, that's a question of how to organize the learning process what is your goal for example if you want to uh, quickly jump into some production code it makes sense to learn only those concepts which are used in in that code base uh, at least it gives you some time to to work with the, that base uh, easily and you can learn other things um, a little bit later uh, i believe uh, program, program, programming languages try, try to do um, try to implement those features in a more convenient way uh, to learn for example rust a very interesting case here because when they implement some feature they immediately mm, propose a way to learn it there there is no feature which could be accepted uh, with, without this uh, learning uh, idea there, there are always a few words on how we should uh, us, uh, mm, approach its learning so they okay. uh, yeah they both are about learning a lot but most of languages just give you something and you have to find your own way or maybe ask someone how to uh, get through it because uh, the number of features is really big For, fortunately once you learn something in one language language something high level like lambdas you can easily borrow this knowledge into another language because uh, the yeah. difference is mostly syntactic yes it's semantic difference also but mostly you need to uh, recognize at least uh, this feature in other environment and you can easily do that okay yeah uh, i mean uh the idea behind the lambda taking the lambda as an example it's the same in all languages because yeah, that yeah. that's how you write anonymous functions, of course. Okay, so going into conclusion, uh, thank you again for uh, for your explanations. Uh, I think that was a very valuable uh, chat. And what are your thoughts about the future of functional programming and functional programming community in general? Uh, I mean. I can guess what are your thoughts, given you know the talk we have uh, until now. But if you if you can summarize your ideas for the futures of programming and community, what what would you say? Yeah, I see uh, a, a, an idea in the communities that we need to simplify uh, our tools and we need to make it easier and cheaper because. Uh, the the farther we we are moving in history, the bigger our systems become and uh, became or like uh, we need to solve uh, uh, artificial intelligent uh, problems uh, right now big problems uh, processing data and etc and we don't want to spend a lot of time in learning because it's so uh, uh, it doesn't make that much um, sense because people in in uh, closest stack sets may may do things faster than we and therefore we see a uh, goal language which is simplified and easy to jump in so there is a certain movement to make things simpler because it's much cheaper and faster and the same at the same time uh, functional prog programming is still in its own uh, evolving path and there are rooms to to go to like uh, dependent types in haskell for example a very uh, big theme and we still uh, we are still um, exploring this ground functional programming is not stuck as oop in oop i i don't really think there is something to 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 invent it's all already there okay uh, what about industry? Uh, we will see um, how functional lang languages become a bit more popular, but not like uh, not very much because OOP will stay a dominant paradigm. Um, and I guess this is 
can be this can be changed uh, op will be dominant paradigm but okay. multi paradigm idea is certainly there and we will see more uh, coming into uh, languages maybe more convenient algebraic data types in C++, <laughs> why not? And um, more features into C Sharp and in Java. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Uh, that was a real pleasure to have you here. And thank you for your thoughts and your knowledge, of course, and your commitment to the community for, uh, you know, spreading functional programming knowledge and writing books and doing talks. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for that. So really hope to have you here for another episode in the future. And thank you. See you next time. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.